I know that there, there are a few new moms that are here today, and so they are experiencing Mother's Day in a brand new way, and so we're so thankful for them. We're not going to call them out. We also know that there are people that are experiencing Mother's Day for the first time without their mom. And then there are others of you who are in between. Your mom still may be living, but you don't have a relationship with them or it's broken. And whether, wherever you are on that spectrum, whether you're a new mom, whether, you're, whether you are mourning the mom who's already passed away, or whether you are just mourning the mother that you had that was just a holy terror, that you still grieve, I want to share something with you today about the gift of the Holy Spirit. That whether you are celebrating or whether you are mourning or whether you are happy right in the middle just the way things are, I want to talk to you about the gift of the Holy Spirit that's a promise for you and for your children and for every generation after you that gives you a life worth living and fills in the gaps that your mama may have left. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for today. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will gift us with your presence and with your peace, and with your purpose, and with your power, Lord. We are yours. You are ours. Have your way in this room and online in multiple rooms around the world to accomplish your purpose so that you get all the honor and glory and we all and others get the benefit. Holy Jesus, have your way. In your name we pray. Amen. So I want to talk to you about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as I talk about the the Holy Spirit, this is something that we've been focusing on for about the last three weeks. And for many of us, whether you have been with us the last three weeks or this is your first time here, I I think it's safe to say that for most of us, we, we are okay, generally speaking, with understanding there's a God. And we kind of get who Jesus is, kind of. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, that's the biggest enigma. We're not like quite sure what the Holy Spirit is. Is the Holy Spirit an it? Is the Holy Spirit a person? Is it just a power? Is it a presence? What, what is the Holy Spirit? And it reminds me of a, of a story about a, a guest who came into to church one Sunday. And because he's a guest, he didn't understand church rules that you always fill the back up first, right? So he came to the very front of the sanctuary and it was a traditional worship service, and the choir started singing Amazing Grace. Some of you are familiar with that, that old standard hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet a sound that saved a wretch like me. And, and as he was singing the words, he was overwhelmed with God's amazing grace. And as he sang Amazing Grace, it was being played on the organ and the piano, he looked around, and, and everybody was singing Amazing Grace just kind of, They were just doing it. They were just going through the motions. But he was like, this is amazing grace. And he started to raise his hands during a traditional service, singing amazing grace. And he just felt so overwhelmed with the presence and the peace and the purpose and the power of God that he began to cause a disturbance. And an usher watched from the very back during the the last stanza of amazing grace, went up to him on the very front row, whispered into his ear saying, are you okay? And the gentleman said, yes, I've come here and I've received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the usher because the usher is there to protect order. He said, well, you did not get that here. Please stop. (laughs) That would never happen here. It just happens somewhere else, right? But the Holy Spirit is disruptive, y'all. The Holy Spirit is disruptive in both positive and negative ways. Depends on what your perspective is on that. But the reason I want to talk to you about the gift of the Holy Spirit today is because it is meant to be disruptive. It's meant to take those things that we think are right side up and actually turn them right side up. It's to change our perspective and our perceptions and help us understand what life truly is, whether we have a fantastic mom, whether we are mourning our mom, whether our mom has died, whether we have children or not. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a promise that is for you and for our children, and for generations to come because of the mercy of God. So let's pick this up. So in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, if you want to go back and look at it, Peter and the disciples were in a room 
the resurrected Jesus has appeared to them and Jesus said, don't leave. My promise is coming for you. I've got to go away now. I've got to go back to heaven. But I want you to wait because you're going to receive a gift that's going to enable you to do things that you never were able to do, to feel about yourselves that you've never been able to feel before, to do things with other people that you never thought you were humanly capable of doing. But wait, it's an act of faith. Wait. And so Jesus ascended. And the promise came and overwhelmed and overcame Peter and the rest of the disciples. And they immediately began operating under the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when they operated under the gift of the Holy Spirit, they started talking to people within the city that they were in. And these people were all from all over the world. And they began to speak the language of the people, not just whether it's English or Spanish, but you know, speak the language. Use words and phrases that really impacted the other person so that it would make a difference. So in response to this, the people responded. And here's what happened. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of what? And you will receive the gift of what? Mm. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. The gift of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want to help clarify what the gift of the Holy Spirit is for those of us who are, who are kind of on a steep learning curve here. Or for others who think that you know what the Holy Spirit is, you might have your... Uh, perceptions blown apart this morning, okay? So when we talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit, it, it really comes down to this, and I would love for you to take notes, maybe get your phone out, take a picture of it. It's worth knowing so that you can grow in it. You take notes about the stock market, you take notes from what Chip and Joanna say on their home shopping thing or whatever they do. Look, you take notes on all kinds of things, take notes on the living word, okay? So here's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is. It is the presence of God. Jesus said through Peter, and Peter said to the people, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the presence of God. Knowing that God is here with you right now, that you don't have to, to, to work at it, you don't have to scratch for it, you don't have to come up with some cockamamie plan about it, you don't have to try to appease God to where now he will show up. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the presence of God himself. And that when you are baptized and you repent and you place your whole trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the gift of the Spirit is the presence of God himself. And as you grow, you will learn to understand that God was already present in your life before you even realized it. He was already working and moving so that you might become awakened to him. And the ongoing gift of the Holy Spirit is that now you know whether you go home and take a nap today, whether you take your mama or your wife out to lunch, whether you go to work tomorrow or you go to school on Tuesday, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the presence of God. Jesus said, you are not alone. For those of you who, out who are out there thinking that, you know, God's busy doing things with other people, and he doesn't have time for you, that is a lie. You need to know that the gift of the Holy Spirit, once you step forward in faith, is that God is present with you always to the very end of the age. Another aspect of the gift of the Holy Spirit is that God's Spirit will bring you peace. I want you to think about all the, the, the things that cause you anxiety and the thing that, things that cause you turmoil the things that, that cause you that when you know you ought to pray, you can't articulate the words to put them together. All you can do is kind of groan and sigh and just throw your hands up in frustration. Those instances, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just his presence, but his peace. It's that peace that surpasses all understanding. It's that when you don't know what to pray, it's God's peace through the Holy Spirit that interprets your moans and your groanings and, and helps cut through all the flack that you can't see yourself. It's that peace to know that when all the world is going crazy, you are not. Because you know the anchor upon which you stand. And that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only his presence, but his peace. And it's not only his presence and his peace, but it's also his purpose. You were created 
on purpose for a purpose. The gift of the Holy Spirit is that confirmation that you are not an accident, that your identity is not tied in with your job or how much money you have in the bank. Your identity is not how big your house is out of Pecan or De Cordova. Your identity is not based on how well you play golf this afternoon. Your identity is not based on how you look to other people and if you give the facade that your family has everything squared away. What gives your life purpose is not all those secondary things. What gives your life purpose is that you were created for a purpose. You were knit together in your mother's womb. And now you are not only here to receive the gift of God through Jesus Christ, but to then go share that with others through your words and through your actions. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That that is a gift he has given you to know that you are not out here just to float in the wind, but you were created on purpose for a purpose. Another aspect of the gift of the Holy Spirit is God's power. I, I, I think we as Christians, we kind of fall into this trap of thinking, well, you know, God is, is really just a crutch. That we're just a call on God when, when stuff goes bad. And if things don't really work out, then I need to throw something up on the prayer chain. I need to let other people know because we're in a jam that we can't get out of. It's always reactive. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is not a reactive spirit. It's a proactive spirit. It's a gift of the Spirit to know that we can operate with assurance and power, that we can be bold and assured at the same time, that we can live a life with our head held, head held high, even when things are going crazy around us because we know who we are and to whom we belong to. So it's the presence and it's the peace and it's the purpose and the power of God to give us that boldness and assurance to know that we are not alone. That is the gift that Peter was talking about with the other people that heard about Jesus for the first time. Now, I want you to think about it. We can hear that. We can take notes on it. We can take a picture of it. But how do you live into it? How do you live into incorporating this gift that you have received? Now, how do you actually put it on and start living with it? Well, this is the rest of the story. If you go a little bit further in Acts chapter 2, this is what begins to happen. They begin to, to work out their spiritual muscles as to know what to do with this gift. Some of us are just walking around as skeletons. We, we may have the very basics of the faith, but we haven't really worked it out to build any spiritual muscle. And what I'm about to share with you is how the early Christians built spiritual muscle as they received and lived into that gift of the Holy Spirit. So let me throw a few things out at you. Maybe you want to take notes on this as well. What they believed mattered. What they believed mattered. If you go to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, you'll see what they did and how they did it really made a difference. So what they believe mattered believed mattered. Y'all share that with me. What they believed mattered. So, so here are some of the things that they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So I want you to get this, and I want you to think relationally. These aren't just doctrines. These aren't just teachings. Look, I want you to think relationally. They had been cut to the heart. They received the grace of Jesus Christ for themselves. They had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now they were focused together on learning really what this whole thing meant. Think about it this way. It's like when someone comes forward to say their I do's to their spouse. They go through premarital counseling maybe. If they go to the church, they go through premarital counseling. They invest in a big honeymoon, do whatever they do, but then they come here and they think they know what it means to be married. How many of you, if you have been married, how many of you knew exactly what it meant to be married when you said, I do? I didn't. Michelle did. I didn't. <laughs> and I said, I do. I took those vows, but then I had to live into it. Okay, this is what's happening with these folks. They are living into their I do to Jesus. And so they had to focus on the teachings of the apostles and really what it meant to believe in Jesus. Otherwise, they would have just been left to make Jesus up in their own image. And the scriptures teach us that there are certain ways to do things. That Jesus is not just a nice guy, but, but he is the Savior. He is God on earth. And he not only was a nice guy, but he died to take away our sins. And he rose again to conquer the power of sin, death, and shame. But not just that. 
Scriptures also teach us what it means to live into this life as spirit-led people. Jesus was talking to his disciples in, in his, before he was resurrected, and he said, how many of you have heard that you shall not murder? So how many of you all have heard that you shall not murder? Have you all heard that before? Jesus said, that's great. But, but anytime you tear someone else down, anytime you speak ill of someone, then you are the very same way committing murder, the same way as if you spilled blood. Just like you're thinking right now, how many of those disciples, when they heard that for the first time, went, what? So with that idea, how many of you have committed murder this week? He also said, Jesus, Jesus also said that as you have been forgiven, forgive other people. It's not enough just to receive it, but the teachings of the scripture say, as you have received it, give it away to other people. Another way to say it is that loved people love people. Now that doesn't come from us because we can always find reasons not to forgive someone. Some of you are having a really hard time forgiving your mother. You go on every which way you can to find some loophole to keep yourself from forgiving your mother because she was a bad mom or she died before you were ready. So you brought that unforgiveness to the church this morning. But what you believe matters. And you have an opportunity now because of the gift of the Holy Spirit to leave your mama at the altar later. Because you can release her because as you have been forgiven, you now have the gift of the Holy Spirit to forgive someone else. So what they believed mattered. Also, how they belonged to one another mattered. This is how the gift of the Holy Spirit is lived out. How they belong to one another. Here's, here's what they did. They devoted themselves to fellowship. All believers were together and had everything in common. Every day they continued to meet together and they broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. How they belonged to one another mattered. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of you may have already picked up on this, but I'm a lone ranger at heart. I always have been. I haven't been a joiner. Some of you are not joiners. You're fine hanging out on the edges. You're kind of okay with slipping in and slipping out with no one having any expectations of you. I get you. I speak your language. If I were not a pastor, I would slip in after the meet and greet time, try to sit on the back row, get my Jesus on, and then leave before anyone else had to say something to me. Amen. <laughs> See, I'm speaking your language. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So look, I know that about myself. I'm an introvert by nature. I don't get recharged by hanging out with you all. I love you to a point, but then I got to go home and I got to get recharged. So part of how I'm made up is, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay by myself. But the Lord has shown me over time how important it is to belong to someone else. For some of you, that's super easy. But for others of us, it's a little bit harder. And I want you to think about this relationally, what this meant, okay? Let's put this in our terms, okay? Let's imagine what it was like for these new people to begin putting on these spiritual muscles of what it meant to live uh, in Christ. So, so imagine uh, there, there's someone who had just lost their mom and they heard the words of Peter the words about life. And they intentionally gathered together with other people and they soon found out that they were not the only one in the world who had lost a parent. And as they intentionally fellowshiped with one another and as they intentionally broke bread with one another, they soon found out that there was someone else who was grieving also. Uh, imagine the kids that were involved in this, that, that how they belonged with one another matter. Uh, imagine that they see their mom and dad, they've kind of stepped forward and they're living into this new life of faith and, and, and things are different now. The mom and dad aren't cussing as much around the house as they used to. They're spending more family time around the table with their kids and their kids are wondering what in the world is going on. And then they belong to other people who are on the same journey. And they start rubbing shoulders with other kids whose family think that faith is really important. And they start putting on those spiritual muscles of understanding that it's not just about what is taught, it's about what is believed and taken ownership of. 
See, when we talk about what you, how you belong matters, it's really not that far of a stretch. We take on the characteristics of those whom we hang out with the most. Now, I want you to think about those people that you hang out with the most, whether it's your coworkers, whether it's your friends that you just go out and do crazy stuff with. Are those the people that are helping you belong to the kingdom of God and know what this gift of the Holy Spirit is? For many of us, we come to church and we just kind of glance upon the surface and we spend the bulk of our time with people who don't care. We spend the bulk of our time with people who have no idea what the gift of the Holy Spirit is. And we end up getting caught in their stream and just floating here and there. But what they belong to mattered back then and what we belong to now matters. It's important for you to know the people who are sitting around you in your pew. How many of you have your assigned seat if you've been here enough times on a Sunday morning? Yeah, I guess you're right there. Yeah. Look, if you have your assigned seat and you haven't make it, taken the step to, to get to know the people around you, why? Is it because you're shy? Is it because you're an introvert? Is it because you're a lone wolf? Look, I speak your language and that language doesn't work around here. Because we're better when we belong to something that matters. That's when the gift of the Holy Spirit, his presence and his peace and his purpose and his power is made manifest. It also makes a difference that, that what they were becoming mattered. What they were becoming mattered. Get, get this. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. See, they were becoming something. You've got to be growing up in the faith to look at your pocketbook or your check account and see it as an instrument of God's grace. Look, many of us may be saved by Jesus and we want that gift of the Holy Spirit, but that has not yet converted our pocketbook yet. But see, we haven't become what it is that God is calling us to be, that, that God wants all of us, not just our soul. That God wants all of us, not just our happy thoughts. But God desires all of us so that we might experience the full gift of his Holy Spirit. And the people back there were so sold out to Christ that they intentionally met together. That's a big deal. They made sure no one in their midst went without. They sacrificed their own earnings to make sure that no one fell through the cracks. And get this, they were stronger because of it. And the people on the outside who had not yet heard about Christ, because these people were going on to maturity, people on the outside were looking at them and going, I, 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 I want what they have. They look like they actually like each other. And man, they're going through a rough time. I know them, I work with them in the marketplace and I know they're going through a crazy time, but they seem to have that peace that surpasses all understanding and they never seem to be going without. They always wanna have money to give to someone else who is in need. They're always coming alongside someone who doesn't have something. And the scriptures say that because they were growing into what it was that they were to become, the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit, his presence, and his peace, and his purpose, and his power. I recognize that there's a certain distance I can go based on my work ethic. I know there's a certain distance that I can go with my personality. I know that faith can be really managed if I just keep it to what I can do myself. But every time I do that, what I do is I take that gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises for me and my children, and I go, nope, I don't need that. I just need to work harder. Is that you? See, the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you, and it's for your children, and it's for your grandchildren, and it's for the people who don't even know Jesus yet. And it's for this whole stinking dark world who is in such desperate need of grace, the Holy Spirit is for it. As God works through you to push back the darkness. What are you going to do with the gift that God is calling you to receive? 
Only you can answer that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen.